Welcome back to Van's Reading. We're on Beyond Order by Jordan Peterson. Uh, we're reading Rule 2, Part 1. So, let's begin. Okay. Uh, imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. Who are you and who could you be? How do you know who you are? After all, you are complex beyond your own understanding. More complex than anything else that exists, excepting other people. Complex beyond belief. And your ignorance is further complicated by the intermingling of who you are with who you could be. You are not only something that is, you are something that is becoming. And the potential extent of that becoming also transcends your understanding. Everyone has the sense, I believe, that there is more to them than they have yet allowed to be realized. That potential is often obscure, obscured by poor health, misfortune and general tragedy, tragedies, tragedies, uh, and mishaps of life, but it can also be hidden by an unwillingness to take full advantage of the opportunities that life offers, abetted by regrettable errors of all sorts, including failures of discipline, faith, imagination, and commitment. Who are you? And more importantly, who could you be if you were everything you could conceivably be? Oof, that's a deep question. I don't know. Let's see in a year. Huh? Let's see in a year what happens. Uh, are these are such questions impossible to answer or are there sources available to us from which guidance might be derived after all after all we have been observing ourselves behave in our success and failures for tens perhaps hundreds of thousands of years during that time our shamans prophets mystics artists poets and bards have distilled something vital from such observations some concentrated essence of what makes us human in actuality and possibility in doing so, they have provided us with representations of the vital essence presenting itself to us as that which can be neither ignored nor forgotten. Those creative people write and act out the dramas and tell us the stories that capture our imagination and they fill our dreams with visions of what might be. The deepest and most profound of these are remembered, discussed and otherwise honed collectively and made the focus of rituals that unite us across the centuries, forming the very basis of our cultures. These are the stories upon which the ritual, religious, and philosophical edifices characterizing sophisticated, populous, su successful societies are built. The amount of words that were fancy there, God, just give me a break, Jordan. Jeez, okay. The stories we can neither ignore nor forget are unforgettable for the reason among others. They speak to something we know but do not know that we know. Weird, okay. The ancient Greek philosopher Socrates believed that all learning was a form of remembering. Socrates posited, is that how you say it? Posited? Maybe posited? This is a very weird word. Um, posited. Give me a second. Posited. Weird word. Posited. Posited. I'm posited. Sorry. Uh, posited means. Uh, Posited. I think it's posited. 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 Okay. My bad. Awkward. Stupid. <laughs> the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates believed, or Socrates, Socrates, I don't know how to say it. The ancient Greek philosopher Socrates believed that all learning was a form of remembering. Socrates posited that the soul, immortal in its essence, knew everything before it was born and knew as an infant. However, at the point of birth, all previous knowledge was forgotten and had to be recalled through the experiences of life. There is much to be said for his hypothesis, strange as it is, might now appear, uh, as it might now appear. So, what is wrong with me today? Okay, let me repeat that. Oh, wake up. There is much to be said for the hypothesis, strange as it might now appear. There is much that we could do, much that our bodies and minds are capable of doing that remains dormant right down to the genetic level. Exposure to new experience act activates this dormant potential releasing abilities built into us over the vast spa 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 what is wrong with me today people i apologize guys but this is going to be the video just me just going through hell all right ignore everything so i'm going to start from that paragraph there is much that we could do much that our bodies and minds are capable of doing that remains dormant right down to the genetic level. Exposure to new experience activates this dormant potential, releasing abilities built into us over the vast span over our evolutionary history. 
just see the tongue twisters here. This is perhaps the most basic manner in which our bodies retain past wisdom and draw upon it when necessary. It is in this way, although not only in this way, that humans possibility, possibility exist. Thus, there is something profound to be said for the concept of learning as remembering. Obviously, as well as remembering as in the turning of an innate but hidden possibilities, we can learn much that is new. This is one of the primary factors differentiating us from animals. Even complex and intelligent mammals such as chimpanzees and dolphins tend to repeat their species' typical behaviors generation after generation, with very little change. Humans, by contrast, can and continually do seek out and encounter what is new, investigate and adapt to it, and make it part of themselves. We can as well translate something we already know at one level of representation into knowledge at another. We can watch the actions of a living creature uh, we can watch the actions of a living creature, animal or human, and then imitate them, translating our perceptions of their movement into new movements of our own. We can even generalize such Im imitative acts, catching the spirit of what or whom we are observing and producing new ways of seeing and acting that are in some manner similar to that spirit. Consider the professional impersonator. He or she doesn't necessarily copy the precise behaviors movement for movement of those being impersonated, but the spirit. What's common across all the behaviors of the target celebrity. The same is true when children play at being adults. It is the spirit they after, not the individual behaviors. Not the individual behaviors. This is part of what makes up the basis of deeply embodied implicit. Not and oh, oh my god. I read the sentence, Yob, and gosh, what is wrong? Hmm. This is a part of what makes up the basis of the deeply embodied implicit knowledge that forms so much of the basis of our true understanding. We can also observe some, someone act or something occur and write down what we see, translating action into language that outlasts its utterance, and then communicate it later in the absence of what or whom is being described. Finally, and most mysteriously, we can imagine and then act our... our oh, God. Here we go again, you Finally, and most mysteriously... Uh, we got this, you Finally and most mysteriously, we can imagine and then act out something that has simply not been seen before, something that is truly original, and we can code and represent all that ability, adaptive action, and its transformation in the stories we tell about those we admire as well as those we hate. And that is how we determine who we are and who we could perhaps become. Stories become unforgettable when they communicate sophisticated modes of being, complex problems and equally complex solutions that we perceive consciously in pieces but cannot fully articulate it is what it was for this reason for example that the biblical story of moses and the israelites exodus from egypt became such a powerful touchstone for black slaves seeking emancipation in the united states go down moses way down in egypt land tell old pharaoh to let my people go to let my people go i love that line gotta watch the animation pretty good stuff <clears throat> The biblical story of Exodus is properly regarded as arch archetypal or paradigm paradigmatic or fun foundational by psychoanalytic and, psychoanalytic and religious thinkers alike because it presents an example of psychological and social transformation that cannot be improved upon. It emerged as a product of imagination and has been transformed by constant collective retelling and reworking into an ultimately meaningful form that applies politically, economically, historically, person, personally, and spiritually all at the same time. This is the very definition of literary, literary depth, literary, literary depth, right? Something that reaches its, oh God, ap apogee, oh God. Dude, Jordan, thank you for teaching me new words here, man. Apogee, apogee. I'm guessing what, what is in the world? pronunciation of apogee seriously apogee, apogee. my dumbass again all right uh blah 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 blah, blah. where the hell are you now <laughs> uh the, that is a very different literary depth something that reaches its apogee in certain forms of ancient traditional stories the fact of the of that depth means that such accounts can be used diversely as a meaningful frame for any process of profound change experienced by an individual or society. Stable state 
decent in chaos, reestablishment of stability, and can lend that process multidimensional reality, context, powerful meaning, and motivation. So I'm just going to repeat that paragraph because it may sound unclear there. The fact that depth means that such accounts can be, can be used diversely as a meaningful frame for any process of profound change experienced by, an, by any individual or, or society, which states like stable state, descent into chaos and no, descent into chaos and reestablishment of stability. So that's what he means by society. Uh, or individual and can lend that process multi-dimensional reality con uh, reality context powerful meaning and motivation so he's just like stating what is the process and he's stating basically um what is society and what you know what kind of depth is he talking about within the stories uh that we you know watch through movies read books through or and like legends etc and yeah it's, it is an understanding it gives us an idea what we should strive for for all good of society which is the definition of being good i guess is become an individual that everyone in some way loves or or you know pushes other people to um you know become the positive or give this push survival in a positive aspect i i can't i want to put it in a more definitive uh, you know way but i'll put it probably do it at the end of this um video <clears throat> the emergence of the unforgettable how might an unforgettable story come to be what might precede its revelation it is a, it is at the very least a consequence of long period of observation imagine a scientist monitoring the behavior of a wolf pack or a troop of chimps indeed any group of complex social animals uh, he or she attempts to identify regularities in the behavior of the individuals in the group patterns in a word and to articulate those regularities to encapsulate them in language. The scientist might first relate a series of anecdotes about animal actions emblematic of the general behavior of the species. He or she might then abstract even further attempting to generalize across anecdotes with rule-like descriptions. I say rule-like because the animals are not following rules Rules require language. Animals are merely acting out regularities. They cannot formulate, understand, or follow rules. But, but human beings, we can observe ourselves. Sorry, let me say. It, but human beings, we can observe ourselves acting as scientists might more accurately as a storyteller might. Then we can tell the stories to each other. The stories are. So let me just repeat that. That sounded wrong. But human beings. So he says here, so he's saying animals, they cannot formulate, understand or follow rules. But human beings, we can observe ourselves acting as a scientist might, more accurately as a storyteller might, then we can tell the stories to each other. The stories are already distillations of, I think it's distillations of observed behavior. If they are not distillations, they will not be interesting. Uh, relating a sequence of everyday actions does not make for a good story. Relating a sequence of everyday actions does not make for a good story. Once the story is established, we can analyze it, looking for deeper patterns and regularities. If that analysis is successful, we can generalize across anecdotes with the formulation of rules, and then we can learn consciously to follow those rules. Here is how this might happen. We all react judgmentally when a child or adult or indeed a society is acting improper, improperly, unfairly or badly. The error strikes us emotionally. We intuit that a pattern upon which individual and social adaptations depend depends has been disrupted and violated. We are annoyed, frustrated, hurt, or grief-stricken at the betrayal. This does not mean that each of us reacting emotionally has been successful at articulating a comprehensive philosophy of good and evil. We may never put our finger on what has gone wrong. However, like children unfamiliar with a new game but still able to play it, we know that the rules are being broken. Something precisely like this is portrayed in the biblical story of Exodus, the ancient, the ancient account of the flight of the Hebrew slaves from the Egyptian masters. Moses, who leads the escaping people, is continu continually called upon by his followers to draw every fine moral distinctions when they struggle with one another and seek his advice. In consequence, he, he spends a very long time observing and contemplating their behavior. It is as if the desert prophet had to discover what rules he and his Israelite followers were already struggling to act out prior to his receipt of the explicit commandments from God, 
Remember, every society is already characterized by pattern behavior. Otherwise, it would be pure conflict and no society at all. But mere fact that social order reigns to some degree does not mean that a given society has come to explicitly understand its own behavior, its own moral code. It is therefore no accident that in this story, Moses serves as a judge for his followers and does so with sufficient duration and intensity to exhaust himself before he receives, receives the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the, mon for from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, <clears throat> What is the thing that thou dost? What is the thing that thou, oh my gosh. Jordan Peterson, please, news words that I can say, man. I'm a smart guy, but it seems not that smart after reading this part of the pages. My God, apologies to everyone watching this, like this terrible video that I'm doing. Anyway, and when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is the thing that thou dost to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Or statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father, Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou dost is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away. Both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Exodus 18, uh, verse 13 to 18, I think. Yeah. This, is, this difficult exercise in discrimination and judgment, observing and weighing, is an integral part of what prepared the biblical patriarch for the receipt of divine revelation. If there had been no behavioral base for those rules, no historical precedent codified in traditional ethics, no conventions and no endless hours of, of, of observation of the moral patterns, the commandments simply could not have been understood and communicated, much less obeyed. An unforgettable story captures the, the essence of humanity and distills, and distills, communicates and clarifies it, bringing, bringing what we are what we are and what we should be into focus. It speaks to us, motivating the attention that inspires, inspires us to imitate. We learn to see and act in the manner of the heroes of the stories that captivate us. These stories call to capacities that lie deep within our nature, but might still never develop without that call. We are dormant adventurers, lovers, leaders, artists, and rebels but need to discover that we are all those things by seeing the reflection of such patterns in dramatic and literary, literary form. That is part of being a creature that is part nature and part culture. An unforgettable story advances our capacity to understand our behavior beyond habit and expectation. Toward an imaginative and then verbalized understanding, such a story presents us in the most compelling manner with the ultimate adventure, the divine romance, and the eternal battle between good and evil. All this helps us clarify our understanding of moral and immoral attitude and action, personal and social. This can be seen everywhere and always. Question, who are you? Or at least, who could you be? Answer, part of the internal force that constantly confronts the terrible unknown voluntarily, part of the internal, fo eternal force that transcends naive, no, this is a hard word, naivety, I'm guessing it's called naivety, and becomes dangerous enough in a controlled manner to understand evil and bearded in its lair and part of the eternal force that faces chaos and turns it into productive order or that takes order that has become too restrictive, reduces it to chaos and renders it to productive once again. And all of this being very difficult to understand consciously but vital to our survival is transmitted in the form of stories that we cannot help but attend to. And it is this manner that we come to apprehend what is of value, what we should aim at, and what we could be. Okay, I'm ending the video there. Okay, well, not ending the video, but ending the reading there. So, I like that. I really like that idea. It's a really inspirational story. 
I like the idea that it doesn't, you see, the thing is with people, you know, as they grow and, you know, learn how to be somebody or gain a personality, right? It seems to me that um, we tend to, because of the environment, the, the, the information provided us, we start to build what is in front, what is in front of us. We take what's in front of us and then build within our own imagination and we create this persona. And what's interesting is he's trying to say, wait a minute, all right, wait a minute, you're not just that, okay, you're more of a, a human being that is able to, you know, react to complex situations, right, and I mean, listen, he's being a bit dramatic about good and evil and, you know, everything, I love good writing, except for the freaking words, a little be easy on me a bit, yeah, I'm a human being, <laughs> but as, you know, as he's trying to say is that you're not just a you know, a person, you're a human being that is able to identify what is good and evil. You're able to identify what is right. You're able to identify what is power. You're able to identify what is strength, what is weakness, what is all these, you know, difficult things in front of you. You're, if you're able to identify it and within these stories, right, you can then definitely become that. Because if you couldn't understand it, right? You wouldn't be able to do it. And I think that's what he's trying to say is that if you're able to understand it, then you definitely are able to achieve it. You're able to actually do it, uh, communicate it, speak it, write it, do it, act, whatever you want it. And it's very interesting um, that he put it that way. Um, absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, I would have put it differently though. Um, it's a, it's a, he wrote it like that to inspire. Uh, in my opinion, I mean, he, I bet you if you wrote it like, yo, dude, right, you're good, all right, this is what's going on. You know, if you put like statistics in front of everybody, we're like, statistics, look at all the statistics, man. And what I think he's trying to do is he's sparking emotion. So you record that specific line, right? So you, when you go out, and it's pretty good writing, in my opinion, because he's obviously read a lot of books and he realized the most. Memorable thing when he reads a book is when it becomes extremely emotional and motivates us and gives us kind of a bit of a goosebump. And that's what this is. And I think what he's trying to, I mean, I said what he's trying to say. He's trying to say you're capable of becoming what you think. You know, if you think it, you can do it. And I think that's the end of that um, video. Anyway, really good uh, part one of rule two. Good start. Sorry for the terrible beginning that you got through. Congratulations, man. I give you a star, but um, yeah, I think uh, you'll probably get the next video soon. I'm a little bit busy at the moment, but I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best, man, to read this shit. Oh, excuse my French, but it's really hard um, because it takes a lot of mental capacity and, you know, it's hard to sleep when you read at night because I'm mainly reading at night because it's the most easier due to work. But there's other things coming along in life. So hopefully, you know, we can read more at once. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be one video. I want to read more. I'll probably do tomorrow or the next day uh, multiple videos. I'm probably going to do one tomorrow and then multiple more. Anyway, thanks for watching. You know, leave some comments, like, subscribe. You know the whole deal. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Cheers, man.